There have been 22 Chinese dynasties. The world will watch their actions in Korea and in like success. Seven of those have lasted longer than the entire history of the United States. In order to improve Sino-American relations, we must start with matters of principle. Will they represent their own interests, or will they be the dupes of others? Such a situation should arise. Sino-American confrontation will not be a question of a few years. It will be of a long duration, but we don't know how many years. Six of them have lasted as long as the entire history of the United States. So you're talking about a different rhythm. In 1949, Mao Zedong became the leader of the most populous nation in the entire world. And he did so after waging a long battle against his political nemesis and leader of the Kuomintang party, Chiang Kai-shek. And while the differences between these two are vast, there is one striking similarity. Each one vowed that once they achieved power in China, they would end what they called the century of humiliation. And this leads me to a question. How does a nation come to find itself humiliated? That's a question I had to think very carefully about and for a long time before I felt comfortable answering. And I've come up with two potential pieces to this puzzle of humiliation. One piece is that the force who does the humiliating has to be one which the humiliated thought they'd be able to stop or defeat. And if we're going to look to history for an example of something like this, I think the Franco-Prussian War would help demonstrate what I'm trying to show. The Franco-Prussian War, kicking off in 1870, is basically a battle between France and future Germany, with Prussia at the head. And France, along with many of its Western allies, thought they would beat the Prussians. However, not only do they utterly fail in doing this, Emperor Napoleon III gets captured. His forces are quickly defeated early on in the battles, and future Germany holds a parade in Paris. And soon after this battle, we see in France the rise of what's called revanchism as a political ideology, or if we were to take the literal French to English translation, revengeism. An actual geopolitical strategy based on revenge. And while this ideology emerges, The French, with its weakened military, gets to watch Germany, to its east, consolidate and build itself. As we know, as fans of history, I'm sure you're familiar with what happens in the coming decades between France and Germany. So that's one piece to the puzzle, as I see it. And the second piece to the puzzle is that there has to be an ideology which underlies the humiliated culture or is is foundational within the humiliated culture that would make them specifically averse to being defeated by a specific force. Now, let's flesh out what exactly I might mean by that. Let's look for a historical example. Ever since the formation of Israel as a state, as a nation, the surrounding Arab nations and populations had had a problem with it, just its very existence. For nearly 1,400 years, the relationship between Muslims and Jews living in the Middle East had been interrupted by pogroms and holy wars of one such kind or another. And yes, there were periods of peace, but the underlying conflict was always liable to flare up, given other external factors pressing themselves upon one or both of these two populations. So well before June of 1967, when Israel brings on a surprise attack from the air and obliterates the Egyptian Air Force, long before this, there had been tensions between these two different populations living in the area. The Six-Day War, as it came to be known, given its duration, was humiliating for the Arab states surrounding Israel. 
And this emotional turmoil, this humiliation, cascaded throughout the Muslim world. And today its effects are still visible. Pick up an Arab newspaper or watch a television program from the Middle East, and you'll notice the problems that still exist between Arab Muslims and Israeli Jews. So as I see it, these are the two fundamental pieces of the puzzle of humiliation. One being that the humiliated have to feel as if they could have defeated the humiliating. And then two, this underlying ideological bedrock, which provides a specific society a grievance against another specific society or population, or in our second example's case, a religious population. And what I like about these two specific examples is the fact that one comes from Europe in a conflict between the French and the Germans, a conflict that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, and then a conflict between two religious populations living in the Middle East, a whole other part of the world. And I think these are useful for our purposes today because we'll be talking about Asia. These pieces of the puzzle of humiliation know no boundaries or continent or specific nation. They pervade humanity. And I think there are other aspects of humanity which we should discuss for a moment before we get into the narrative of the century of humiliation. This century that China experiences starting in the middle of the 19th century and going all the way up until the rise of Mao Zedong in 1949. And one of these other aspects of humanity that I want to talk about is this idea that's sort of hard to explain. And the best way I can explain it is that cosmopolitanism is a new idea. This is not something, you know, this idea that we should incorporate other cultures into our lifestyles and that we should feel some way at home within another culture and that, you know, we can take and share and give to one another across cultural lines. This is a new concept. This is not something that historically has been appreciated by most societies. You might see kings intermarrying or kings and queens intermarrying, um, going across these national and cultural boundaries throughout history. But very rarely will you see the main body politic within a given society adopt in any significant way the culture of an alien society. But even if this seems to be a universal aspect amongst humans that they tend to feel comfortable in and appreciate their own culture more so than that of others, well, the Chinese specifically in the time period we'll cover today will be averse to the types of changes that are imposed upon them both culturally and economically, soon politically too, which outside powers bring to China. And why might the Chinese be specifically averse to the changes that they'll witness in this time period? Well, some of it, in my opinion, has to do with the sheer age of China's culture. It's said in one form or another that the Chinese civilization is so old it can't quite remember its beginnings. A French traveler who made his way to China in the 19th century named Abbe Huck noticed this as well. After traveling in China and studying its society and culture, he wrote the following, quote, Chinese civilization originates in an antiquity so remote that we vainly endeavor to discover its commencement. There are no traces of this state of infancy among this people. This is a very peculiar fact respecting China. We are accustomed in the history of nations to find some well-defined point of departure, and the historic documents, traditions, and monuments that remain to us generally permit us to follow, almost step by step, the progress of a civilization, to be present at its birth, to watch its development, its onward march, and in many cases, its subsequent decay and fall. But it is not thus with the Chinese. They seem to have always been living in the same stage of advancement as in the present day, and the data of antiquity are such as to confirm that opinion." End quote. I love that phrase, the data of antiquity. It's such a clear way to describe how exactly the Chinese of the 19th century view their past. It's a set of data that applies 
well to their own time period as it did to the past. If you're going to look for a founding father in Chinese history, you might point to the Yellow Emperor. But even the Yellow Emperor, who comes to ancient China in a moment of chaos and helps bring order, even he finds China already in existence. And if you want to credit Confucius for the founding of Chinese culture, well, he himself denied this and said rather that he was just reinvigorating Chinese culture with the principles of past generations. And this ends up creating the idea that these principles and this style of governance has been around in China forever, or that Chinese history is somehow different from the history of other nations. However, the Chinese of antiquity mostly lived in a very advanced society, one of the most, if not the most, in the world at any given point, in terms of military, societal structure, naval capabilities as well. The Chinese were at the forefront of all of these advancements quite early on. However, by the 19th century, China's ability to protect its borders, both its nation's borders and its culture's borders, begin to fray. And by the middle of the 1800s, this should have been quite apparent. The Qing Dynasty, the, the ruling dynasty in China in this time period, should have been able to recognize that the ships that are arriving on their shores and the weapons that these people from the West are using will make them a formidable opponent in the future if the Chinese do not advance to that level of capability. But this was either unrecognized or ignored by much of the Chinese ruling dynasty. So much so that even in 1863, the emperor of China is still referring to himself as the emperor of the Middle Kingdom, basically the ruler of the universe as well. So if we want to understand the century of humiliation, we need to understand how exactly it's possible for the Qing dynasty to explain its role in the world in the way it does at the beginning of this century of humiliation. How is it possible that in 1863, U.S. President Abraham Lincoln receives the exact letter he does from the Chinese emperor? Well, Lincoln is caught up in the U.S. Civil War. He receives a letter from the Chinese emperor which sheds light on exactly how the imperial authority in China is still seeing itself in the celestial order of things at this point. I'm going to go ahead and read just a portion of that letter, which I think does well to help us get towards answering that question of what exactly this background is like. The emperor writes to Lincoln, quote, Having, with reverence, received the commission from heaven to rule the universe, we regard both the Middle Empire, that's China, and the outside countries as constituting one family, without any distinction, end quote. Having received the commission from heaven to rule the universe... Well, that's a posture that I don't imagine Abraham Lincoln could have understood at that point. Because by 1863, the Chinese had had extensive contacts with peoples from all reaches of the globe. And they'd lost two wars to Western navies pretty quickly and easily if you compare how formidable the Chinese military has been historically. And what else is interesting about this letter lies in the fact that this emperor himself, like Lincoln, is fighting a civil war. And this is a civil war which seems indicative of one of the problems that people in Chinese society are pointing out, especially people in the Chinese administration. And this is a problem like, how do we get these foreign devils or foreign barbarians as outside peoples are known in China at this point. How do we get these people out? Because by the time this civil war kicks off, which will become known as the Taiping Rebellion, by the time this rebellion kicks off, U.S. ships importing Turkish opium and British ships importing Indian opium 
have presented themselves as a huge problem for instilling order. And it's not just the trafficking of opium, which presents itself as a major problem in China at this point. It's also the fact that when the Chinese fully put their foot down and begin to institute even further measures against the importation of foreign products, well, the British solved this problem by sending gunboats, right? These are the very convincing and swift victories against Chinese military opponents that really should signal to Chinese authorities at this point that some type of innovation must be necessary if their goal is to truly ward off what they're calling Western barbarians. The British see all this, well, at at first as odd. They think that their concept of free trade has universal value and would be accepted universally. However, the Chinese show little interest in this. In their early efforts to open up trade in China, the British demonstrate how severely they misunderstand the culture they're dealing with. China's much more unified than India was when the British East India Company first made their way to the subcontinent. While there are on the ground numerous linguistic, ethnic, and religious differences in China, One finds when they look at Chinese history that there is a certain importance placed on having one ruler over the entire body politic of China, right? One ruler who holds the mandate of heaven, who sits atop the imperial throne. And this idea is not totally based in fact. Of course, there are many years and decades in which there isn't one ruler over all of mainland China, and there are many eras in Chinese history where we can see two or three dynasties on the ground at one time or near dynasties. One thinks of the time period that the Mongols came in and they end up founding their own dynasty. But the Chinese hold closely this idea of the mandate of heaven, at least so during the time period we'll be discussing, even if it's not grounded in historical fact. This idea of the mandate of heaven basically asserts that, well, it is the job of a Chinese ruler to maintain harmony between the population and between nature. Nature serving as a very inclusive word in that phrase, nature basically being the order of things. As Francis Fukuyama, the author of The Origin of Political Order, as he explains, there really isn't a religious context here. Fukuyama writes, quote, The heaven in the mandate of heaven was not conceived of as a deity in the sense of the monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which laid down a clear set of written rules. Rather, it was more like nature or the grand order of things that could be upset and required a return to equilibrium, end quote. Fukuyama then goes on to explain how there aren't really any prerequisites for attaining the mandate of heaven. Sure, it's more likely that you're to come from a, the gentry class or from some wealthy family with influence, but you could also be a commoner. There are instances where commoners rise to the imperial throne. Um, he also goes on to explain how you know this labeling of someone who had received the mandate of heaven often comes in the future. Historians also confer this label upon you know past rulers. So with all of this in mind, especially the idea that the mandate of heaven needs to be held by someone who is maintaining order and maintaining harmony, well, Fukuyama asks the question, does this just make might right in China? He uses a useful comparison, at least for someone who's interested in sort of social theorizing. He goes back to Thomas Hobbes. Fukuyama writes, quote, In his book, Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes argues that the sovereign derives his legitimacy from an unwritten social contract by which each individual gives up his natural liberty to do as he pleases in order to secure his own natural right to life, which would otherwise be threatened by the, quote, war of every man against every man, end quote. If we substitute group for man, it is clear that many pre-modern societies operated on the basis of such a social contract, China's included. End quote. He then goes on to answer his own question about you know, whether or not might makes right in Chinese societies. Well, his answer is, to a large extent, yes. But he also notes that it just can't be the case that the most tyrannical power is the one that gains access to this mandate of heaven. 
Now, the way you gain access to the mandate of heaven and the way you hold it is by a return to Confucian values. He goes on to explain, quote, The Confucian idea of the rectification of names meant that emperors had to live up to ideal types of predecessors. They had to possess something like Machiavelli's quality of virtue that characterized the successful prince. A would-be emperor obviously had to be a born leader, someone who could inspire others to follow his authority and could take risks to achieve his goals. Leadership was most often exercised in the domain of military affairs, which is why so many dynastic founders got their start as military officers. But China prized military prowess to a much lesser degree than did other civilizations. The Confucians very much had in mind an ideal of an educated scholar bureaucrat and not an uncouth warlord. A pretender who did not exhibit both deference toward Confucian values and a certain subtlety born of education would not attract support of various factions around the court. End quote. So if you're going to be the emperor or the empress of imperial China, there's a number of responsibilities that you have to take on. One of them is this adherence to Confucian principles. Another is maintaining this posture of a learned elite. As Fukuyama pointed out, while many get their start as military commanders, you can't necessarily rule as a military commander. And this partly explains why China has such a long written history of their international and diplomatic affairs. There's a heavy emphasis placed on the ability to maneuver out of situations without putting you know, military commanders and an army on the field. And part of this is due to this mandate of heaven, due to the fact that rulers of the past have seen this, putting an army on the field against an opponent's army, as a way of legitimizing the current rebellion, as a way of maybe ushering in this right of rebellion and inviting it. But if we turn away from diplomatic documents and search through some Chinese military strategy, we'll notice some coherence as well. The following is one of the more famous passages from Sun Tzu's The Art of War. And it gets at this idea of avoiding battle at all. Quote, Ultimate excellence lies not in winning every battle, but in defeating the enemy without ever fighting. The highest form of warfare is to attack the enemy's strategy itself. The next, to attack his alliances. The next, to attack armies. The lowest form of warfare is to attack cities. Siege warfare is a last resort. The skillful strategist defeats the enemy without doing battle, captures the city without laying siege, overthrows the enemy state without protracted war. End quote. But the problem here is that when the British show up to China's shores, they are one of the most powerful and technologically advanced societies in the world, and potentially the most capable too, in terms of using the materials they have. The situation's quite different, and this is what the Chinese don't quite understand. But we have to note that wrapped up in this Chinese way of life and in this Confucian outlook, the emperor has a task which the British make basically impossible. And that task is maintaining China's image, at least the image that China's population has for itself. And this is one of China being the most superior culture and the most superior government on the planet. Now, how can the British disturb this? Well, the British will show up, as we'll see, with the best technology they have to offer. And this is going to be something which Chinese administrators are very fearful of because it imposes itself on that idea that I just laid out, on this idea that, well, the Chinese culture is the most superior, comes up with the best technology, is the most advanced in general. The British are specifically trying to knock down that idea so they can expand their trade into China. This will be the fundamental problem which the Chinese have with Western merchants and Western powers who seek to trade in China. Chinese administrators are right in fearing that, you know, having all of these Western products and these Western ideas infiltrate their culture and their society, well, this can't be good for maintaining this image of China as the most advanced society in the universe. So in 1793, when the British send a private citizen with 
a history of international dealings named Lord George McCartney to China, his mission is one that is wholly impossible. Its main goal here is to establish a British embassy in Beijing and a Chinese embassy in London. Up until this point, the only thing comparable to an embassy in China is a Russian Orthodox mission that the Russians had got only by way of force almost 100 years earlier. The Chinese are not exactly open to the whole embassy thing. One of the methods that McCartney and his team will use in order to persuade the Chinese to open up their ports and to allow for the establishment of these embassies is to bring with them the fantastic products of industrialization. In addition to that, they'll, they'll bring some forms of Western art that the Chinese may not have encountered before. The following is from Henry Kissinger's On China. Quote, To help further his aims, McCartney brought with him numerous examples of British scientific and industrial prowess. McCartney's entourage included a surgeon, a physician, a mechanic, a metallurgist, a watchmaker, a mathematical instrument maker, and five German musicians who were to perform nightly. His gifts to the emperor included manufacturers designed at least in part to show the fabulous benefits China might obtain by trading with Britain. Artillery pieces, a chariot, diamond-studded wristwatches, British porcelain, and portraits of the king and queen. McCartney even brought a deflated hot air balloon and planned, without success, to have members of his mission fly it over Beijing by way of demonstration. End quote. However, the Chinese who bear witness to these new products that are supposed to entice them are rather hesitant to show their approval. And McCartney himself notes this. When McCartney fires off a few of his cannons in order to demonstrate you know, British military might, he notes that, quote, our conductor pretended to think lightly of them and spoke to us as if such things were no novelties in China, end quote. McCartney also notices that almost everything they say is being recorded in some way or another. But in addition to this feigned indifference, McCartney also notes that the Chinese are deploying a strategy of diplomacy, which is thousands of years old, even if McCartney himself is almost certainly unaware of the historical nature of the methods the Chinese initially use against the British. And within this strategy that the Chinese will be deploying against the British, this strategy that is thousands of years old, well, they have an assumption built in, and it's one that maybe they shouldn't have taken for granted. And this assumption that the Chinese have carried into the 19th century is something like, all barbarians are the same, or all barbarians will come to find that the pleasures of China are more advanced or refined than their own. And this is a strategy that the Chinese have been able to use against people from the north, that is Mongols or nomads from the steppe. This is a strategy that's worked very well against these types of peoples. History has told the Chinese that invaders will eventually adopt the Chinese way of life and Chinese governing styles. And this historically is true. This is what happened with Mongol invaders. And most recently, if, if we're talking about the 19th century, Manchu invaders from the north as well. So the Chinese are used to having invaders show up on their borders, maybe even take some land. But once they do, to sort of adopt the Chinese way of life, right? So these steppe nomads become sedentary. And when they become sedentary, the idea here is that they begin to lose some of that fervor that you might have if you're a steppe horseman. And the reason why a steppe horseman might be inclined to adopt the Chinese way of life, well, it's just a lot easier. One, southern China is far more fertile than the Eurasian steppe or even northern China. So just in terms of a health standpoint, it makes more sense to adopt this way of life and to settle down. Uh, but beyond that, too, the organization which China's government has been able to display, you know, far outmatches anyone else in Asia for you know, most of China's history. It almost might be interesting to think of this process 
as reverse colonization. So if you wanted to think about Europeans making their way to North America, they find some you know, nomadic or semi-nomadic tribes who they either incorporate into their society or slaughter, mostly the latter. But in this circumstance, you have the invading and militarily superior force adopting the culture of the defeated. Has China been defeated if the thing that they want to retain is this culture? Have they been defeated if they're allowed to retain the culture? If an invader comes in and the way of life doesn't change, but merely the ruler at the head of the dynasty? And, you know, this isn't to say that when a new ruler comes to China from, you know, the north, if, if a Mongol comes in, that there won't be changes. Of, of course there will be. But there's a reason why Chinese civil service exams emphasize Confucius for as long as they did. There's a reason why the Chinese classics retained their value in Chinese culture for as long as they did. So now that we understand that part of the emperor's job is to maintain this mandate of heaven, and we understand him to be doing this by holding to these Confucian values that other emperors have in the past, well, we can see the obvious problem that early Dutch and Portuguese travelers and merchants would present to this administration. When they start arriving in the late 1400s, some early travelers start arriving from Europe, um, there are some problems. They notice early on that there is some interest within the wealthier classes living in southern China, specifically Canton, who actually enjoy these products. And this infringes upon this whole Confucian value and, and where China sees itself in the order of things. So what they'll do is they will basically force a mass migration out of Canton and out of the surrounding areas where merchants can influence the Chinese population. They'll also remove populations from small islands on the coast. And this retreat inland will remind me of a quote I've read in preparation for this project from Chairman Mao Zedong. And without reciting the quote verbatim, he'll basically say that in preparation for a nuclear attack, everyone will simply move inland, like the Chinese Communist Party will do later on in this story. The reaction to this cultural nuclear bomb in this time period in China when it has to do with trade is somewhat similar to the reaction to real physical nuclear bombs in the 20th century. And this idea is, again, wrapped up in Chinese diplomatic and military strategy. So when McCartney heads to China, he'll notice some of these ancient strategies being deployed against him and his men, even if he doesn't actually know their origins. McCartney points out that the emperor of China at some point during this trip will serve him and his men wine, and he finds it odd. However, this plays with a strategy that's like I said, been deployed in China for thousands of years. The following is a quote from a Han Dynasty minister. The Han Dynasty existed for about 400 years from 200 BC to 200 AD. So this should give us an idea of how old these strategies are, these strategies they'll use against the British. This Han Dynasty minister on how to anesthetize barbarians. Quote, to give them elaborate clothes and carriages in order to corrupt their eyes, to give them fine food in order to corrupt their mouth, to give them music and women in order to corrupt their ears, to provide for them lofty buildings, granaries, and slaves in order to corrupt their stomach. And, as far as those who come to surrender, the emperor should show them favor by honoring them with an imperial reception party in which the emperor should personally serve them wine and food as to corrupt their mind. These are what may be called the five baits. End quote. The Five Baits. That is the inspiration for this first episode, mostly because we'll be talking about the failure of the Five Baits to serve its purpose in the 19th century. So while the British are unaware of what exactly is happening or how exactly the Chinese are viewing them in the 19th century, they will soon come to recognize the intractable nature of the Chinese imperial authorities. While the central task of the British and McCartney's mission is to open up 
a mission in Beijing and a Chinese mission in London. Well, the main goal for these imperial authorities is to get McCartney to kowtow to the emperor, to get him to prostrate himself on hands and knees in front of the celestial emperor. There are conflicting accounts of whether or not this happened, but it's commonly thought that it didn't. McCartney leaves China with his cannons and German musicians, highly disappointed and having not fulfilled any part of his task. In response to McCartney's request to open up trade in the southern ports of China, the emperor gives him a blunt and uncompromising reply. The emperor, in a message which is to be sent along to King George III, informs McCartney of the following. Strange and costly objects do not interest me. If I have commanded that the tribute offerings sent by you, O king, are to be accepted, this was solely in consideration for the spirit which prompted you to dispatch them from afar. As your ambassador can see for himself, we possess all things. End quote. And this goes back to what's at the heart of this five bait strategy. The five baits is designed to convince a population that the Chinese way of life is superior. Well, the British are not open for this possibility. The British are not even really trying to transplant their culture into China. They're trying to open up China to their products. But these strange and costly objects that the British are bringing with them to China are really just seen as tributes to the emperor. And if the emperor were to open up trade or to accept these gifts, in some ways that would show that the British have a culture that's on par with the Chinese. And this is not in the cards for the emperor. In McCartney's assessment of his 1794 mission to China, he foreshadows future military engagements between the British and Chinese. He writes that, quote, a couple of English frigates would be an overmatch for the whole naval force of their empire. In a half a summer, they could totally destroy all the navigation of their coasts and reduce the inhabitants of the maritime provinces who subsist chiefly on fish to absolute famine, end quote. This is a severe break from the idea that the Chinese have of British naval capabilities. They think that London, which they're not even, at least all of the administrators are not sure where exactly London can be located on a world map. They think that the distance which the British Navy would have to cover would just be too great for them to wage any kind of warfare. They think that they will involve themselves in a war of overextension. This will prove to be a severe miscalculation once the British return to China after dealing with Napoleon. The British don't send another mission to China until they're done worrying about their neighbors to the south. And in the interim between McCartney's mission to China and the next mission that the British government will send to try and open up more trading options for them in China's ports, something interesting will happen. The opium trade in China will explode. And this had been slowly happening ever since you know, about the 1770s, 1780s, but now it's become a real problem. The British have realized that the best way to rectify this trade imbalance that they've always experienced with the Chinese dynasty, because we have to remember, the deal with China is that you bring in silver, specifically silver, and you leave with product. You don't bring in product to China and then sell it there. And one of the problems with trading silver in China, which is the currency that they have been slowly accumulating, one of the problems with this is that this is how... Western nations pay their mercenaries. So they're not interested, especially with what's heating up in Europe in the late 1700s and early 19th century, they're not interested in letting go of any silver they don't have to. So the way that they'll correct for this is by spilling opium into China's ports. In fighting the French, the British have not just ignored diplomatic relations with China, They've also ignored some other aspects of their trade. This war on the European continent has caused them to lose sight not only of China's southern ports, but of their interests in the North American fur trade, which largely includes exploiting the Pacific Northwest for its furs and sending them to China. Now, the Americans view any opportunity to get a leg up on the British as a positive one, 
There's a lot of antagonism between the two nations for pretty obvious reasons at this point in history. And Americans are happy to take the opportunity, while the British are entrenched in a war on the continent, to expand their influence across North America. U.S. traders interested in taking advantage of China's humongous population had already been importing more than half of Turkey's total opium crop on a yearly basis. And they've begun also to move into the British East India Company's territory in India, competing with them now for the opium trade in China. So Americans can view China at this point in history not as a huge market that they'd like access to, but also as a point which they could win from the British and thus begin to take over their role as traders on the global stage. And judging by the accounts of traders in China living on the southern coast, they seem much happier to deal with Americans instead of the British. They view the Americans as much more receptive and much more willing to play the game that the Chinese have erected for their southern ports. And they view the British as a bit more haughty and stuck up, and they don't like the demands that they come at the imperial dynasty with. However, this relationship between the U.S. and China will hit murky waters in the 1820s. In September of 1821, a sailor named Francis Terranova, who's working on an American ship in China, is accused of killing a woman in the marketplace. He's accused of hitting her in the head with an olive jar after a banana sale gone wrong turns violent. The Chinese authorities will demand Terranova to be handed over to them, which the Americans are prepared to do as long as Terranova gets a fair trial. However, partway through the trial, um, it's cut short, and it appears that uh, a fair verdict from the American point of view won't be coming down. Uh, the Chinese judge o overseeing the case pronounces him guilty before anyone on the American side is satisfied that justice has been served. In response to this, the captain of Terranova's ship refuses to hand him over, and the Chinese then cut all trade with the United States. Just over two weeks later, the Americans compromise and hand Terranova over to the Chinese officials, who then proceed to strangle Terranova and kill him. And all while this is going on, the British are basically on the sidelines taking notes. They're seeing how the Americans might have just set a precedent for how you deal with foreigners who commit crimes on Chinese soil. And they're not interested in handing over any of their men uh, and placing them in the care of a justice system which they don't think is particularly just. The select committee of the British East India Company will weigh on on the Terranova case. And, and this is the company largely responsible for transporting huge amounts of opium from India to China. They'll say that the Americans have, quote, barbarously abandoned a man serving under their flag to the sanguinary laws of this empire without an endeavor to seek common justice for him, end quote. So this Terranova case will turn some heads in Britain and turn some very important heads. And it will basically become the impetus for Britain seeking what's called extraterritoriality for their citizens in China. Extraterritoriality is this concept that the British are seeking, which would basically allow any of their national citizens to travel to China and be treated in China as if under British law basically taking the right from the Chinese to try and prosecute people acting in their own nation the way they want. This will be something the British will seek when they return to China in the 1830s. They simply won't stand for what the Americans had just allowed. In 1834, the British will send a Scottish naval officer named Lord Napier to China in order to, once again, seek these embassies, one in London for the Chinese, and one for the British in Beijing. And while Napier will end up dying due to malaria while in China, while he's there, he does note the existence of a place named Hong Kong. He notes that it's not overly populated or cultivated and would serve as a great harbor for the British to exploit. Soon after Napier dies in China, a Chinese administrator named Lin Zexu is charged with the task of expelling all opium from the southern ports which Americans and British had been bringing it into. 
1839, when Lin makes his way to the southern port of Guangzhou, he orders all Western merchants to forfeit their opium and blockades them until they do, essentially holding them captive. Lin also dispatched a rather infamous letter to Queen Victoria. Lin to Queen Victoria wrote, quote, In several places of India under your control, such as Bengal, Madras, Bombay, Patna, Benares, and Malwa, opium has been planted from hill to hill, and ponds have been opened for its manufacture. The obnoxious odor ascends, irritating heaven and frightening the spirits. Indeed you, O king, can eradicate the opium plant in these places, hoe over the fields entirely, and sow instead the five grains. Anyone who dares again attempt to plant and manufacture opium should be severely punished. End quote. Lin here essentially strong-arming one of the most powerful rulers in the world with the greatest naval capabilities in the world, but still abilities that are unrecognized by the Chinese administrators. After the British ships hand over their opium and are allowed to leave, Palmerston sends a fleet in order to blockade those ports. This could be the event where we say, okay, here is where this century of humiliation begins, especially if we're going to give the century of humiliation its name due to the fact that foreign powers encroach upon China's peripheries. This is Britain showing up to China with gunboats and, as we'll see, getting pretty much what they want. This will be a trend going forward that does not slow down and one which the Qing dynasty has to be aware of. As we've discussed, part of the Qing dynasty's job in keeping their own position is keeping foreigners out. So when the British show up to China with guns, this changes the equation for the Qing dynasty. Now they are forced to negotiate with these barbarians and these Western merchants who they believed they had full control over until about now. As we've said, the Qing dynasty refers to outsiders as barbarians. Well, if the people you're openly calling barbarians can push you around, well, how does that appear to the people who you rule over? You know, how does that look when you begin to concede exactly what these barbarians want you to? But in reality, this practice of the British using opium to undermine the Qing dynasty's authority had been taking place for nearly a century, even more, if you really wanted to go to the roots of this opium trade in China. You know, it might be useful to take a step back and realize that opium had been introduced to China as early as the 8th century, probably by Muslim travelers from the West. But as far as its recreational use is concerned, this appears to be something new uh, around the time period that we're dealing with. The Dutch and their Dutch East India Company uses the product to expand its trade into China early on, and thus begins its use as a recreational drug and its spread, but mostly amongst poorer peoples, people in Taiwan, people that the Qing Dynasty didn't have much respect for people that didn't involve themselves in the politics of China or the power dynamics. But in the 18th century, uh, Qing Dynasty officials begin to notice that, well, this drug is making its way up to the court. And military officers, too, are more increasingly being found under the spell of this Western narcotic. For nearly a century prior to this first opium war that kicks off after Lin Zexu's decree, uh, we see the Qing dynasty trying to expel opium in some way or another from China. As authors Timothy Brook and Bob Wakabayashi in their work Opium Regimes, China, Britain, and Japan, as they point out, this process of trying to get rid of opium had been going on since the 1720s. They write, quote, the earliest Chinese to consume it, as the court discovered in the 1720s, were, quote, worthless young men from Taiwan, end quote. This text portrays opium as a commodity that, quote, cunning barbarians used to trick Chinese out of their money, end quote. A complaint that would be repeated up to the present. When other reports from officials on the southern coast followed, the emperor banned the sale and distribution of opium. His edict of 1729 identified dealers, rather than smokers, as legally culpable. 
reserving the damning epithet, Chinese trader, for those retailing the opium, not those consuming it. Subsequent edicts repeated the restriction and imposed more specific penalties. It is impossible to say whether such legislation had any effect on the trade, which in any case continued to grow, albeit slowly. About 200 chests of opium entered China in 1729. Sixty years later, that amount had only doubled. The floodgates opened a little wider in the early decades of the 19th century, especially after the East India Company lost its monopoly on the opium trade in India in 1839. In response, the annual average for 1817 through 1820 rose to more than 4,000 chests. The imperial government's response was harsh when it perceived that consumption was spreading from commoners to the elites and from southerners to residents of the capital and denizens of the court. But new legislation proved powerless against the deadly combination of expanding Chinese demand and skyrocketing British supply. When activist official Lin Zexu was appointed Imperial Maritime Commissioner in 1839 to stop the opium trade, the annual flow of the drug into China had risen to well over 30,000 chests. End quote. So by the time that Lin Zexu is charged by the imperial administration with the task of getting all of this opium out of these southern ports, well, the British are not likely to acquiesce. They got thousands and thousands of chests of opium that they would like to use to trade with Chinese merchants. So their investment is greater now than it ever had been in the past. But even when the British arrive with their fleet, the Qing dynasty is still not immediately convinced that they have a serious problem on their hands. It's going to take a bit more convincing than just to arrive and blockade a port. Again, imperial administrators are placing a lot of confidence in the idea that the British are simply too far away from China to sustain this war. One administrator wrote, quote, The English barbarians are an insignificant and detestable race, trusting entirely to their strong ships and large guns. But the immense distance they have traversed will render the arrival of seasonable supplies impossible, and their soldiers, after a single defeat, being deprived of provisions, will become dispirited and lost. End quote. Soon after this, Lin sends yet another letter to Queen Victoria. Quote, you savages of further seas have waxed so bold, it seems, as to defy and insult our mighty empire. Of a truth, it is high time for you to flay the face and cleanse the heart, and to amend your ways. If you submit humbly to the celestial dynasty and tender your allegiance, it may give you a chance to purge yourself of your past sins. End quote. But once the British fleet makes its way to China, their Navy's capabilities become, well, much more clear. Once British cannons are aimed directly on these southern port cities, the Chinese are convinced it's time to sit down for negotiations. What comes with these negotiations will have lasting negative effects for the Qing dynasty. They'll be forced to pay a $6 million indemnity to the British and also cede Hong Kong. In handing over Hong Kong to the British, the Chinese had basically just given up their right to levy these taxes and extort these bribes from British merchants. And this is what was keeping trade somewhat even between the Chinese and the British. Beyond this, the Chinese are also forced to recognize this notion of extraterritoriality for British citizens operating in China. This has the somewhat predictable effect of allowing anyone that's white in China to basically claim British citizenship and then get off from having to deal with Chinese justice. This only further exasperates many of the problems that Chinese citizens are having with these Westerners and these Western ideas infiltrating their culture. And back to this British claiming of Hong Kong for a second, this will totally undermine the entire project that the Qing dynasty had undertaken for itself. As the British will end up saying themselves, getting Hong Kong will essentially provide for them a warehouse for their opium supply on Chinese soil. The book Opium Regimes, China, Britain, and Japan, 1839 through 1952, is a collection of essays, each sort of exploring one aspect of opium in Asia during the time period we're concerned with. One of these essays, written by historian Christopher Munn, discusses Hong Kong's role. Munn writes, quote, Hong Kong's viability as a colony was also closely linked to the opium trade. 
Early Hong Kong served as, quote, the central warehouse for British Indian produce, end quote, and had little other trade to sustain it. By the late 1840s, it was estimated that three quarters of the entire Indian opium crop passed through Hong Kong. Hong Kong broadened its economic base in the 1850s when it became a center for the coolie trade between China and the New World and began to develop banking, shipping, and entrepot functions that have sustained it to this day. For much of the remainder of the century, however, the transshipment of opium to China continued to be a vital part of the colony's trade. Indeed, the opium trade in Hong Kong are so obviously intertwined that it is hardly possible to consider the early history of the colony without some reference to the drug. The colony was founded because of opium. It survived its difficult early years because of opium. Its principal merchants grew rich on opium, and its government subsisted on the high land rent and other revenue made possible by the opium trade. End quote. So not only did the Chinese fail to repel the British, they end up giving them land. Land that they'll use to prop up this opium trade in China that has been increasing more and more for the last few decades. This will do a number of things. Well, you know, one of them would be that it's going to get the attention of some other Western powers who have their own interests in China. Every inch that the British get there is an inch that other Western powers are missing out on. They're viewing this whole thing as a zero-sum game. That is, like I said, whatever the British get is something that other nations won't get. And every inch the British get will be an inch that they'll use to get other footholds in China in the future. No one wants to be left out of this game that the Chinese will end up calling the slicing of the melon. No one wants to be left out and not get their own peace. So the United States will follow Britain in trying to get this policy of extraterritoriality for their citizens in China. And President John Tyler will accomplish this in 1844. On top of this policy of extraterritoriality, he'll also get for the United States this label known as most favored nation, or maybe it's a status. This is the idea that whatever China offers to another country in terms of trading rights or commercial rights, they also have to offer to the United States. So if we're going to talk about slicing up the melon. This is the United States way of getting their fair cut. Soon after the United States gets this extraterritoriality and most favored nation status, the French will follow right behind them, and they'll get extraterritoriality for their citizens in China as well. You know, it's one thing for the Chinese to perhaps open up their trading ports a bit more or to begin to dismantle this system of bribes and taxations that some of these Western merchants, excuse me, all of these Western merchants have had to deal with, but it's this policy of extraterritoriality, well, this totally subverts this Confucian way of thinking about rule of law and about the Chinese rule of law as being superior in some way, right? The United States won't even open a jail for citizens that will commit a crime in China until after 1900. This will be the beginning of a series of treaties that the Chinese will come to refer to as the unequal treaties. These are the agreements signed between Western nations and China throughout the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, which are basically, you know, one party holding a gun to the head of the other and saying, pick up this pen and sign this paper. So we should imagine what it would be like for a Chinese citizen, let's say living near the coast, who has seen, you know, an influx of Westerners over the course of their life, and they've also seen an increase in the amount of opium smoking going on in their town. And, you know, if you're familiar with the effects of opium, you can understand how depressing this might seem for someone to watch. And then you turn to the Qing Dynasty, and they're negotiating with the very people who are bringing this opium in. And then they grant these people this status of extraterritoriality, which will prevent the Qing dynasty and, and other officials in China from prosecuting these criminals under Chinese law. Well, this will chip away at the very thing that the Qing dynasty needs to maintain, this mandate of heaven, which is cemented by holding to these Confucian values. This policy of extraterritoriality will not help the Qing dynasty. Problems from these unequal treaties will emanate from both their own population, that is the Qing Dynasty's own population, and from the Westerners they negotiate with. Their own population will be left very dissatisfied, and increasingly so as more and more of these treaties begin to pile up throughout the course of this story. And the Westerners, well, they're going to be quite encouraged. 
they're going to seek access to this colossal market that China seems willing to offer up now, at least when they're on the wrong end of a gun. But even while these powers are still anxious to get more and more concessions from China, they're still interested in keeping the Qing dynasty in place. They realize that if civil war were to break out in China or if things were to get really, you know, unstable, the commercial market which they want to open will be essentially closed, that commerce will break down, and that it really is in their best interest to keep the Qing dynasty in place but mold them into the type of dynasty which they can most easily do trade with. So if the Qing dynasty's authority is cemented by their ability to hold to these ancient ideals that Chinese people have for themselves, well, it, it's the explicit project of Britain and the United States and other Western powers to strip that away from them, thus leaving them in no good position to rule over China. But we should remember that it's not just Western powers who give the Qing dynasty problems during this era of Chinese history. There's domestic problems at work as well. The Qing dynasty is also dealing with a number of linguistic and ethnic differences which have been around in China for you know, hundreds of years at this point. The Qing court is mostly made up of Manchu elites who are a minority ethnic group in China. You know, and they rule over a you know, predominantly Han Chinese population. So the seeds of some of the problems we'll see later on have been planted for some time. And further exacerbating other problems they've had, the Qing dynasty experiences, and more properly, their population experiences, numerous famines and natural disasters and episodes of mass starvation during the 19th century. And none of this you know, allows the Qing dynasty to industrialize the way they should, the way the Germans and the Brits do, and more locally, the way that the Japanese are industrializing and the way that the Russians are also industrializing. So the technological gap between China and the rest of the world will continue to expand. And as we see, technology will only become more and more valuable to anyone who holds it. The Qing Dynasty has a number of problems it must deal with if it wants to survive this carving of the melon that these Western powers might seek to partake in should Japan and Russia militarize in a way that would totally overwhelm Chinese capabilities. And we discussed that products up until this point were the most disastrous thing that Westerners have introduced, opium being the main culprit. However, we also spent some time discussing the fact that ideas will also make their way into China. And one idea that Westerners, especially Americans, have always been inclined to spread as far as they could was Christianity. And China, you know, as seen by the Americans, is basically this holy grail of proselytizing. There's millions and millions of, as they would have described it in the 19th century, heathen souls ready to be saved. And the denomination of Christianity, which is most concerned with proselytizing, especially abroad, during this time period, is the Baptists. Just to give some perspective on their growth, by the time of the American Revolution, there were about 10,000 Baptists living in America. But by the time that Americans receive extraterritoriality for themselves in China, there's almost 300,000. And one of these Baptists who makes his way across the Pacific to go preach in China is a Tennessee preacher named Issachar Roberts. And if you don't know Issachar Roberts, then you know that's sort of unsurprising. He hasn't come down in history as a great figure in any way, but he's certainly an interesting one. And the role that he plays in the bloodiest war that takes place in the 19th century on the globe is certainly worth exploring. So in 1847, Issachar Roberts is living and proselytizing out of his Welting Baptist Chapel in Guangzhou, and he has, up until this point, been incredibly unsuccessful. Most missionaries find their work in China to be one that uh, you know, doesn't result in many converts. But this soon changes. Two men one day arrive at his Welting Baptist Chapel, ready to hear about the Christian faith. And one of these two men relates a vision he's had to Roberts. He says that in this vision, a man with a golden beard has informed him that he must, quote, exterminate the demons, end quote. And, you know, this is something that probably would have elated Issachar Roberts. He is one of these, you know, fire and brimstone type preachers from the South. 
This man that has had this vision also tells Roberts that he has quit the practice of worshiping his ancestors and has also begun to encourage many of his you know, fellow townsmen to do the same. This man standing before Issachar Roberts at his Welting Baptist Chapel is named Hung Ji Kwan, and he will lead one of the most devastating and bloody revolts in Chinese history. He'll be at the head of the Taiping Rebellion. But before he leads this Taiping Rebellion, Hung Ji Kwan will spend a few months with Roberts at his chapel, memorizing hymns and learning the Bible, and they'll actually have a falling out before Hung Ji Kwan is ever you know, formally baptized. And it's only after he leaves that he begins you know, gathering his forces for this future rampage across China. And how Hung Ji Kwan pitches himself as this leader is also fascinating. Hung Ji Kwan is calling himself the brother of Jesus Christ. So if we were going to just talk about the celestial order of things, this is a complete affront against Confucianism and a lot of the ideals that the Qing dynasty finds valuable. But the political disruption that Hung Ji Kwan brings about in China can't compare to the devastation that accompanies it. This Taiping Rebellion will be responsible for the deaths of about 20 million Chinese, a number that eclipses numerous times the amount of people that fall and die in the Napoleonic Wars. Just to give some context for this, the high number given for the Napoleonic Wars fought in this century is somewhere around 6 million. And the Taiping Rebellion is a civil war. If you wanted to compare it to the American Civil War at the same time, well, per capita, the Taiping is more destructive year by year and lasts almost three times as long. That is, if you scaled the American Civil War up to meet the populations involved in the Taiping Rebellion in China, you still wouldn't come to the level of destruction that the Taiping cause. And this is not a war led by Napoleon or by Grant or some military genius, but by a member of a minority group in China known as the Hakka, and also who is forwarding this alien religion from the West. It's a fascinating example of, you know, the great man of history, if you're going to buy into that narrative of history. Well, this is a very strange great man that nearly succeeds in overthrowing an enormous dynasty. Soon after Hung Ji Kwan leaves the Welting Baptist Chapel, run by Roberts, he'll begin raising his army, the army that will one day be called the Taipangs. And just four years after he begins this process, he's at the head of 60,000 men, 30,000 of which are Han Chinese, this ethnic majority in China that has been ruled over by the Qings, who are Manchu, for hundreds of years. This will get the attention of the Manchus and the Qings, and even more so as we can start to see the systematic slaughter of any Manchus that the Taipangs come into contact with as they begin moving out of the south. And so the Qing dynasty will send some imperial forces to meet them, and they're destroyed. This Taipang rebellion is starting to look a little bit more serious than the Qing dynasty could have expected initially. So one of the things the Qing dynasty will do as these Taipangs are picking up steam is they'll start encouraging the gentry class in some of the towns and villages that are expecting to see Hung Ji Kwan's forces soon. They'll start encouraging this gentry class to start raising some armies of their own, or rather maybe militias would be a better term. And you know, so they'll start gathering their forces and they're gonna be using their own revenues you know, many historians will point out that this could be the beginning of a problem that will meet the Qing dynasty near its end. That these local militias will become more loyal to their own towns or villages than they will be to the Qing dynasty. And this gets back to the idea of, you know, if you're paying taxes, shouldn't you also be paying for defense as well? And, you know, if you're paying the imperial dynasty and you're also paying your local gentry military general, well, which one of them is protecting you? Interestingly enough, Hung Ji Kwan will maintain contact with Issachar Roberts, and from their correspondence, it seems as if Hung Ji Kwan really had some respect for Roberts. But part of what could be at work here is also more strategic thinking. Hung Ji Kwan might be thinking that, well, 
we got a bunch of Christians living in Europe and America, and they're prone to take up arms with their Christian brothers. Well, maybe they'll come to China and help me decapitate and precipitate the fall of this Qing dynasty. However, you know, Europeans and Americans won't be too interested in helping the plight of a man who considers himself on par with Jesus Christ. We have to remember that Hong Ji Kwan is pitching himself as the brother of Jesus Christ, and he's using this vision he's had to justify his rebellion. Issachar Roberts will bring this idea that he just got from Hong Ji Kwan to a U.S. consul working in China named Humphrey Marshall. And, you know, Humphrey Marshall sees the problems with Hong Ji Kwan and how he might relate to U.S. and European Christians, and he tosses the idea out. But he is interested in getting involved in what's happening on the ground in China now in the 1850s. He suggests to the U.S. government, you know, up the ladder, that they should get involved on the Qing side. And the reason for this is something that we've spent some time covering. He thinks that the tearing apart of China would be terrible for U.S. commercial interests there. And also that in this state of weakness, with this you know, civil war going on, other European powers will step in and start to chip away at China's soil once again. Marshall will actually end up getting fired for pushing this idea up the ladder a bit too forcefully. But a few short years after he's fired, some more evidence will come down to suggest that he might not have been completely wrong. In 1856, the British go to war with China again. This is the second of those two wars, which I mentioned, come before Lincoln receives that letter from the Chinese emperor, informing Lincoln that the Chinese are indeed the rulers of the universe. And this second war is sometimes referred to as the Second Opium War. It's also called the Arrow War at times. And this is a reference to the British ship, which is at the center of the beginning of this conflict. The British ship Arrow is inspected in a way which offends the British. Chinese inspectors are said to desecrate the British flag and treat them, well, not as the British appreciate being treated. We've noted in the past that Chinese merchants and inspectors and dock workers have had more problems with the British than they have had with the American merchants that come to their shores. The British respond by seizing a couple ports, and they also take land in North China, which would allow them easy access to Beijing. At this point, the Qing Dynasty, who's in the middle of this battle against the Taiping rebels, now must take notice of these British ships and military personnel who are moving in closer to the capital. The Qing court once again folds under the hand of the British. The British receive access to additional, what they're calling treaty ports. They also receive further protection for missionaries working in China, and they also receive a permanent status for their embassy in Beijing. In discussing some of the reasons why the British are so eager to control what's going on at these Chinese trading ports, S.C.M. Payne, author of The Sino-Japanese War, 1894-1895, wrote the following, quote, These treaties were not the first of the so-called unequal treaties. Extraterritoriality, externally fitted tariffs, and treaty ports were the essential features of the treaty port system governing China's trade relations. Westerners might force the Chinese to sign unequal treaties, but the latter had no intention of enforcing them, so there were regular complaints among Westerners that the Chinese did not adhere to their treaties. And then Payne continues to discuss some of the ironies about this system being put in place by Westerners. Quote, the system was not without its ironies. Although a creation of Western imperialism and the object of enormous Chinese rancor, its primary function was to ensure the equitable collection of tariffs primarily paid by foreigners and then to make sure that all this money made it into the Qing dynasty coffers. End quote. So in some ways, this goes back to the idea that Western powers want to keep the Qing dynasty in place but want to degrade its authority. And one of the ways to keep it in place is to make sure that the money that Westerners are paying into this tax system they've erected actually make it to the Qing dynasty and their bank accounts. So what Payne's saying here is that the corruption at these ports is such that it's hurting everyone. 
the Qing dynasty is not getting the revenues it expects, and the people benefiting from the system are these individual actors who work within this corrupt setting, put in place not necessarily by the Qing, but reinforced by the Chinese ideology that places China in the middle of the universe and places it above the rules laid down by outsiders. And anyone in Britain at this point who is looking at these new treaties that have just been forged and saying to themselves, well, these haven't worked in the past, will have a lot of evidence come their way quite soon that will support this position. Peace between China and Britain is short-lived. In May of 1859, British sailors who are sailing down a Chinese river, which they have gained access to due to this most recent treaty, find that the river is blocked by spikes and other kinds of barriers. And when they go to remove these barriers from the river, they're slaughtered. Chinese troops waiting by open fire on them, killing over 500 British troops and wounding nearly another 500. In response, the British, along with French troops, march on Beijing, and they burn down the emperor's summer palace. With the Qing dynasty feeling helpless, while British and French troops seem to be having their way in Beijing, they turn to the Russians. And we've mentioned the Russians at this point, but only briefly, we've touched on how Russia seems to want to expand its land mass in any way it can, and has been doing this for centuries at this point. And this presents itself, this war between the French, the British, and the Chinese, this war presents itself as an opportunity to do more of the same. The Russians will offer the Chinese one of their state officials, who will then convince the Western powers that the river they've used to get to Beijing will freeze with the coming winter, thus they'll be landlocked, and also surrounded by a number of disgruntled Chinese peoples who have just watched them burn down the imperial palace. In exchange for this, the Russians receive a large portion of territory in what's called Manchuria. This is an area that will become increasingly valuable over the course of the coming decades. And it's an area that will be competed over by Russians, Chinese, and Japanese. And the Russians just took 350,000 square miles of it. Soon after this event ends, in 1861, Prince Gong, who is basically the de facto head of state at this point in Chinese history because the emperor is no longer healthy enough to perform his duties, Prince Gong will write the following of the current situation in China and what their likely future might hold. And just for some context, Prince Gong will reference the Nian Rebellion, which is another rebellion occurring in northern China, which we don't have enough time to cover in today's program. Prince Gong writes, quote, Now the Nian Rebellion is ablaze in the north and the Taiping in the south, our military supplies are exhausted and our troops are worn out. The barbarians take advantage of our weak position and try to control us. If we do not restrain our rage but continue the hostilities, we are liable to sudden catastrophe. On the other hand, if we overlook the way that they have harmed us and do not make any preparations against them, then we shall be bequeathing a source of grief to our sons and grandsons." End quote. This is one of the early declarations we'll see by a Chinese administrator which points to the facts on the ground. That, well, one, China's not strong enough to fight off any of these Western powers. And two, if China wants to be in a position in which they can do that, they'll need to adopt many Western tactics and Western methods in order to repel them. And this will basically look like a mission statement for many of the young and up-and-coming state officials in China who will be known as the self-strengtheners. Their goal will essentially be to retain the Qing dynasty's dominance over China by using Western science and Western thought. This effort has a number of effects, some of them very positive, some of them involving the building of schools, the introduction of science into the curriculum, but it will also degrade the Qing's authority because the Qing will no longer be acting as if Chinese norms and the Chinese culture 
is the dominant way of living and dominant outlook in the world. The state official in China who's given the lead on instituting this new policy formulated by Prince Gong is a man named Li Hongzang. Li Hongzang will be at the head of this self-strengthening movement. This man will be an integral part of our story going forward, and so will another character who will soon ascend to the most powerful position in all of China. The Qing Dynasty, at around the same time Li Hongzang, comes to head this self-strengthening movement, while well, at the same time the Qing Dynasty will get a new empress, not an emperor. A woman will now hold the most powerful position in all of China. Her name was Xi Qi, or Xi Xi, also known as the Empress Dowager, or the Empress Dowager would be the correct pronunciation. I have a tendency to use Dowager, keeping together all of these names, which you know exist in a language I don't speak. It's been a bit of a struggle, but my bluntest apologies. So Xi Qi's path to power begins you know, during this Taiping Rebellion, when the Emperor Zhan Feng is ill and basically incompetent, and in his absence, a regency council is put into power, basically a collective of senior officials who will make decisions while the emperor is unable to do so. And an important part of this story is the fact that Zhan Feng has only one son, a five-year-old birthed to him by his concubine, Si Qi. Once this Regency Council is named, it is said, and often disputed by other historians, that Si Qi makes her way into the Emperor's bedchambers, and then persuades him to officially name his son, and Si Qi's son, the successor to the throne. This would leave Si Qi in a rather untouchable position. You can't go around killing the new Emperor's mother. But if she were to remain just this former concubine, well, then her position is much less safe. The emperor will die soon after, and the decree that Si Qi emerges from his bedchambers with has a major flaw to it. It's not stamped with the proper imperial seal. And this is why this story that Si Qi you know, lays out isn't convincing to many historians or really convincing to this regency council who she's overtly trying to usurp with this decree. So it's not all that surprising that after the emperor dies, Si Qi, along with Prince Gong, this somewhat pro-modernizing elite official who she's known for a while, it's not surprising that they'll go to war with the Regency Council and win and have them beheaded, leaving her as the sole authority over the imperial dynasty. While her son is still named the official emperor of China, he's in fact, as the Chinese call it, quote, son in servant to the empress, i.e. his mother, Si Qi, who is given by a vote of senior officials, quote, personally deliberate power over all government matters. As Jonathan Fenby explains in his The History of Modern China, Si Qi is often maligned by the Communist Party in China and also by Western writers uh, discussing this time period. You know, this image of a concubine turned empress is sensationalized. And, uh, you know, she's really defamed in some way as being more concerned with palace intrigue and, you know, lascivious routes to power, let's say, than she is with her administration. She's accused somewhat credibly, um, this one is a bit confusing according to the sources, of embezzling funds that were, you know, supposed to go to the military in order to build up her summer palace. But, you know, you have to take a step back and wonder, is there another way forward? Obviously, embezzling funds might not be the best way forward, but is there a real route towards remedying the problem that Si Qi faces, not just in her administration, but in her you know, nation's attempt to free themselves from the grasp of foreign powers. But what these sources certainly relay, the ones that are maligning Si Qi and the ones that are a little bit, you know, maybe more balanced, they relate that she is a calculating and skillful strategist when it comes to palace intrigue. That doesn't seem to be in question at all. As writer for the London Times, Jonathan Bland explained it, quote, hers was the brain, hers was the strong hand that held in place the forces of disintegration, end quote. 
Soon after Xi Qi ascends to the throne, the Chinese military strikes a stunning blow against these Taiping rebels. At a port, it's said that all of them are decapitated, and the river is then filled with their headless bodies. Soon after, a showdown comes at Shanghai, which will concern the French and the British a little more you know, deeply than some of these skirmishes that are happening elsewhere. The French and the British had gained concessions in Shanghai in 1842, and they're going to be concerned with their commercial interests there. Imperial forces from China will accompany the French and the British in their defense of Shanghai, and leading these soldiers will be Li Hong Zhang, the head of this self-strengthening movement in China. And Western forces now getting involved in this Taiping Rebellion will open the door for yet another American to make his way into the annals of Chinese history. As we said earlier, Issachar Roberts is the Tennessee Baptist minister who ends up finding Hung Zikuan on his ministry's doorstep one day. And uh, as we know, Hung Zikuan is the man who will eventually come to head this Taiping Rebellion. This other character that comes into the fold comes in on the opposite side of the battle. Frederick Townsend Ward was born in Massachusetts, and by the time he gets to China in 1859, he's basically a broke mercenary. Ward had been a sailor who made his way to China. He later shows up in Mexico as a mercenary, later makes his way to Crimea for the same purposes, and when he comes to China originally, he's seeking to join the Taiping side. However, he can't make his way to Nanjing, so he ends up turning to the Qing. And what's interesting about this time period in the Taiping Rebellion is that we've just discussed how the British and French take advantage of the Qing's weakness and launch another attack in response to the arrow's perceived mistreatment by the Chinese. But... At the same time that they'll burn down the Emperor's Summer Palace, they'll offer the Qing Dynasty assistance, along with Frederick Townsend Ward, to fight back the Taiping. Now, this goes to the heart of what this century of humiliation is all about, if you're looking at it from you know, the West's point of view. The goal for many of these Western states, like France and Britain, is to keep the Qing in place because that would serve to provide the structure necessary to import and export goods from China. But they can't have them in a position in which they're powerful enough to regulate that trade. So the fact that the British and French can fight and help the Qing dynasty at the same time, well, this is very representative of their goals. So Frederick Townsend Ward, with the assistance of these French and British troops will put together a team of Filipino dock workers, local disgruntled merchants, and he'll offer them the prize of any loot that they can gain while they proceed to stamp out the Taiping. At this point, we have to remember again the kind of effect in China that allocating this type of responsibility to an outsider might have. It's not a good look when the Celestial Dynasty needs the help of men like Frederick Townsend Ward. After a few months of training, Ward will bring his militia to battle. And against much larger Taiping forces, they win swift victories and present themselves as, quote, foreign devils that should be worried about if you're a member of the Taiping army. We begin to see the Taiping flee from the battle more and more. What Ward understands is that these dock workers and some of these low-level merchants also stand to lose a great deal should Shanghai become besieged or should it be invaded by these Taiping rebels. So he can adopt these forces into his military. And over the course of the year 1862, Ward leads his men to a series of decisive victories against these Taiping forces, pushing them and then following them further south in a bloody rout. And Li Hong Zhang, along with some of these other young generals, can stand by and watch him and study his strategy and discover what it is that makes these Westerners so formidable on the battlefield. Li Hong Zhang will even have Ward end up training his forces 
and the Qing dynasty will end up giving his forces the name the Ever Victorious Army. A deep respect has you know, here developed for what the Westerners can do on the battlefield. And when I say on the battlefield, I don't mean in a tent some you know, few miles away from the scene. I mean actually getting in the mix. Frederick Townsend Ward will lose a finger in one of these battles. And finally, in September of 1862, he'll get shot in the stomach and die. And the respect for his you know, memory in China will last basically up until the Chinese Communist Party comes to power. The Qing Dynasty will call him a good man, a soldier without fear and blameless. And they will go on to erect monuments to Ward, which, like I sort of mentioned, will be torn down by the Chinese Communist Party when they come to power. So on both sides of this Taiping Rebellion, we'll see Western ideas come on the scene. With the Taiping, we'll see you know, a Hakka minority uh, run along with a Han beleaguered majority and take up you know, this quasi-Christian mythology with Hong Ji Kwan being the brother of Jesus Christ. And we'll see Frederick Townsend Ward introduce you know, new military strategies to the Chinese imperial dynasty on the government side. On one hand, the Taiping Rebellion will give the Chinese much to fear about Christianity, and one can't blame them if you, you know, see the experience that they've just had with it. And then on the other hand, we have the administration seeing these Western militaries do what they do on the battlefield, and they realize that you know, this self-strengthening movement might be something we really have to take on. Just a couple of years after Frederick Townsend Ward is killed in battle with the Taiping, the Qing dynasty begins to stamp them out. After the Taiping rebels are chased from Shanghai, they go east, and Li Hongzang and his imperial forces follow. In a series of battles, they begin to annihilate any of the remaining rebels. One city they find 40,000 of them within the walls, and when the attack fails, they simply starve them to the point where they can no longer defend themselves. When the remaining rebels surrender, Li Hongzang has them all put to death. By the spring of 1864, imperial forces are surrounding Nanjing, the very place where Hong Ji Kwan and the rest of his court is stationed. They again employ this method of starvation, and it's believed that Hong Ji Kwan himself dies from eating a poisonous plant. A month after his death, the Qing forces enter Nanjing, and again another slaughter ensues. And this essentially marked the end of the Taiping Rebellion though there would be rebels who would flee south and hold provinces there. They were much smaller, and eventually by 1871, all of these actors are killed. But we have to remember that in order to quell the Taiping Rebellion in the first place, the Qing Dynasty created a problem for itself. This was the problem of employing local militias to basically do the work of the central political authority in China. These local militias don't just give up power once the Taiping is annihilated. They end up consolidating it, many of them levying their own taxes upon the populations which they now govern. In Jonathan Fenvey's book, A History of Modern China, he described the situation like this, quote, Armies like those raised by Li, which had been formed on a local basis, owed their prime loyalties to their commanders and not to Beijing, while the long civil wars and the perpetuation of sizable militias installed violence and militarization as a characteristic of national life. The pattern for much of the following decades was thus set in the dynasty's rescue from its greatest peril. Though there appears to have been little or no awareness at court, this would, in time, prove to be its final challenge." End quote. So this is the situation that Li Hongzang and other Chinese self-strengtheners must address. And this time period of self-strengthening also marks a turn in the administration's understanding of their own situation, as evidenced by a statement by Li Hongzang himself. Near the end of the Taiping Rebellion, he writes, quote, The present situation is one in which, externally, it is necessary for us to be harmonious with the barbarians, and internally, it is necessary for us to reform our institutions. If we remain conservative, without making any change, the nation will daily be reduced and weakened. Now all foreign countries are having one reform or another, and progressing every day like an ascending of steam, 
Only China continues to preserve her traditional institutions so cautiously that even though she may be ruined and extinguished, the conservatives will not regret it. End quote. This is not only a piercing analysis of the situation on the ground for China, but also an astute observation about how far conservatives are willing to go in their retention of the Chinese way of life. But it's important to remember that Li Hong Zhang is not a westernizer. He's not interested in a full-scale adoption of the western way of life or the western political system or democracy. He's interested in exploring ways to strengthen the system that's already in place on the ground in China. And if this means adopting some of these Western sciences or implanting some of these military innovations into the Chinese system, then so be it. But it's all in an effort to further cement this sort of Confucian slash Chinese way of governing. In the early 1870s, Li Hong Zhang begins to move up the ladder of the Chinese dynasty. One of his early high posts gives him control of all negotiations with foreigners at these ports in northern China. He built railways, cotton mills, and coal mines, began to develop steam-powered ships in order to transport large amounts of supplies. Li Hong Zhang takes it upon himself to begin this act of self-strengthening that China experiences in the latter half of the 19th century. It might be useful here to take a moment and consider how Chinese peoples are being treated abroad, because talk of this treatment will make its way back to China and have significant political effects on you know, how they think about the outside world. One of the places we'll see many Chinese immigrate to is America. You know, and specifically around the time that this Taiping Rebellion kicks off, right? Right around the middle of the 19th century, we'll see a takeoff in the amount of Chinese immigrants making their way to the west coast of the United States. You know, so in 1850, there's only 4,000 Chinese workers in the west, but by the next year, there's 25,000. Pretty soon after, Chinese will make up a third of the populations of states like Idaho and Montana. And, you know, this will mostly be dirty work in coal mines and laying down railway tracks, the Chinese and the Irish specifically. And there are accounts by journalists which are just harrowing, you know, about the treatment of these workers and about you know, what they're paid and their hours and basically how they're looked at by their bosses. Mm-hmm. For example, in 1865... The Central Pacific Railway Company begins hiring Chinese workers to lay down railway track between Utah and California. And the Central Pacific Railway Company will report that 137 Chinese will die during the building of this railroad. But as Jonathan Pomfret explains in his book, The Beautiful Country in the Middle Kingdom, this didn't tell the full story. Pomfret writes, quote, The conditions were horrendous. Winter brought avalanches, spring landslides, summer 120 degree heat. Central Pacific records said that 137 Chinese perished building the railroad. But on June 30th, 1870, a reporter from a Sacramento newspaper saw a train car filled with Chinese bones. He counted the remains of 1,200 men inside. The frontier writer, Joaquin Miller, described teams of Chinese bone collectors who followed the railroad, collecting the remains of the dead workers so they could be shipped back to China for burial among their ancestors. They were, Miller wrote, the caravan of the dead, end quote. And while the owners of these railway tracks will appreciate the work, the cheap labor, which the Chinese can offer them, The general feeling of Americans towards Chinese begins to sour at the end of the Civil War. And as Pomfret points out, the end of the Civil War created a million new workers, but all of whom were out of a job. Many went west, but the factory industry in the west uh, was not as developed as in the east. So there weren't as many jobs there. And when they turned to the railways, well, cheap labor is flooding in from Asia. There's little work there as well. This will kick off an era which will end in the Chinese Exclusion Act. However, not before thousands of Chinese living in America are treated horrendously. It starts by disallowing Chinese workers to intermarry 
that is, marry white people. And this is especially damaging for Chinese workers because there's so few women from China making the voyage over from Asia. So if you want to have children, your best bet was likely to hook up with an Irish girl, as Pomfret explains as well. With this law being passed where this is no longer an option, well, you have no real future to think about for your lineage at least, or at least developing a family in America. Soon you begin to see violence on the ground. In Los Angeles in 1871, a brawl breaks out between local Chinese and Latino and white Americans, which ends with the lynching of 16 Chinese. By 1882, President Chester Arthur signs the Chinese Exclusion Act, which bans skilled and unskilled laborers from China from coming to America for 10 years. This would be the first time that American lawmakers pass a law which bars a certain ethnic group from entering the United States. However, this does not stop the bloodshed. In Rock Springs, Wyoming in 1885, 28 Chinese miners are shot to death after they refuse to join a union. A couple years later, over 30 Chinese gold miners are robbed and left for dead in a river. Out in California, many Chinese respond, as Pomfret explains, in a typically American way. They went on strike. They performed boycotts. They armed themselves and soon begin to sneak into America through Mexico, leading one lawmaker to call for a, quote, Chinese wall along the Mexican border. By the 1880s, Li Hong Zhang is commenting on the situation and taking offense at the American treatment of Chinese. Pomfret writes the following, quote, By the late 1880s, Li Hong Zhang was fed up with the United States. He took the tightening of the Exclusion Act and the unwillingness of the U.S. government to admit Chinese to West Point and Annapolis as a personal affront. The Americans, he said, make a profession of dealing justly with all the world. How have they dealt with China? They refuse us citizenship. They suffer our people to be murdered or expelled by armed mobs. They shut us out to their country, except under certain severe restrictions. And then when we agree to these, they break them off and exclude us altogether. End quote. So when this self-strengthening period kicks off in China at the end of the Taiping Rebellion, we see Chinese workers abroad being mistreated and a general turning away of America from China. And this turning away happened in the sphere of trade as well. From 1864 to 1875, we see the level of trade between China and America drop nearly 80%. By 1880, trade with Japan had overtaken trade with China. And there's good reason for China and Li Hong Zhang himself to be weary of this. Li Hong Zhang very early on recognizes Japan as, quote, the most immediate threat. In 1874, as China is attempting to undertake this act of self-strengthening, which involves building these new mines and railways and trying to integrate commerce more effectively, um, as all of this is going on, Japan, growing in strength and military power and more effectively instituting its own buildup, takes a long string of islands, which include Okinawa, all the way up to Taiwan and invade Taiwan. After realizing the situation at hand, Li Hung Zhang wrote of Japan the following, quote, Her power is daily expanding, and her ambition is not small. Therefore, she dares to display her strength in eastern lands, despises China, and takes action by invading Taiwan. Although the various European powers are strong, they are still 70,000 li away from us. Whereas Japan is as near as the courtyard or the threshold and is prying into our emptiness and solitude, undoubtedly she will become China's permanent and great anxiety. End quote. This is Li Hung Zhang demonstrating for us his skillful foresight. Because not long after Japan takes these islands, the First Sino Japanese War will kick off. And up until this point, Westerners had been slow to realize what exactly is happening in Japan in the second half of the 19th century. Japan is modernizing and industrializing at a pace that far outmatches both China and Russia. So while Russia had always been a concern for some of these Western powers that are worried about Russia one day overwhelming China, 
um, or that you know these Chinese civil wars would be a huge problem for Westerners and their commercial interests there. In 1894, Japan presents itself as a deathly capable military force. And what they're able to accomplish in the first Sino-Japanese War shocks the Western world. John King Fairbank and Quang Ching Lu describe the scene on the eve of the first Sino-Japanese War. In the Cambridge History of China, they wrote, quote, On the eve of the First Sino-Japanese War, China appeared, to undiscerning observers, to possess respectable military and naval forces. When war between China and Japan appeared likely, most Westerners thought China had the advantage. Her army was vast, and her navy both outnumbered and outweighed Japan's. The German general staff considered Japanese victory improbable. In an interview with Reuters, William Lang, Lang is a British military captain. William Lang predicted defeat for Japan. Lang thought that the Chinese Navy was well drilled, the ships were fit, the artillery was at least adequate, and the coastal forts were strong. Although Lang emphasized that everything depended on how China's forces were led, he had faith that, quote, in the end, there's no doubt that Japan must be utterly crushed, end quote. So the Western powers were not ready to witness this type of ability coming from Japan. They thought they were outnumbered. And as some other observers, you know, describe for themselves, they think that Japan is this land of pretty dolls and toys. In his 1904 book, Impressions of Japan, George H. Rittner wrote the following, quote, In less than 20 years, Japan has acquired the knowledge it has taken us centuries to learn. Japan really made her debut in the world history when she declared war on China. Everyone considered them a nation of dolls and pretty toys, and were astonished when they found brains in their heads and courage in their hearts, end quote. So while Li Hung Zhang is quite aware of the effects that this buildup is having in Japan and the military power it's lending them, well, this fact is still lost in the 1870s and 1880s on the Western world. The Western world is under the impression that well, the Chinese are doing quite well in this self-strengthening period. And it's true, they are doing better than they had at the end of the Taiping Rebellion. I mean, it, it's hard to do much worse when you know, 20 million people are in the process of being eliminated from your nation's population. But yes, the Chinese had made some advancements. But it seems from writings that Westerners had taken them to mean more than they actually did. This is something that SCM Payne points out in the beginning of her book, The Sino-Japanese War, 1894 to 1895. After this war, it will become quite clear to the West who should be feared in the East. But until that time, Li Hung Zhang still has to deal with Japan himself. And one of the ways that he'll attempt to check Japan is by strengthening China's hold on Korea. And this is a topic we have not covered much so far today, but Korea will increasingly become a more and more important piece to the puzzle that is Asia. And that is because Japan will soon attempt to rip Korea away from the influence of China. For hundreds of years, Korea had been fiercely independent. But over time, they, in order to retain you know, nominal independence, allowed for Beijing to have significant influence on the political atmosphere in Korea. But as Japan continues to industrialize and continues to reach outwards, you know, with acts like taking Okinawa and encroaching on Taiwan, well, the Koreans will begin to feel the pressure as well. Of this whole situation, Henry Kissinger in his book on China wrote the following, quote, Throughout the 1870s and 1880s, China and Japan engaged in a series of court intrigues in Seoul, sparring for predominance amongst royal factions. As Korea found itself beset by foreign ambitions, Li Hung Zhang advised Korean rulers to learn from the Chinese experience with invaders. It was to organize a competition among potential colonizers by inviting them in. And he goes on to explain a bit more using Li Hung Zhang's quotes. Kissinger continues. On this basis, Lee proposed that Korea, quote, seize every opportunity to establish treaty relations with Western nations, of which you would make use to check Japan, end quote. Kissinger continues. 
Western trade, he warned, would bring, quote, corrupting influences, end quote, such as opium and Christianity. But in contrast to Japan and Russia, which sought territorial gains, the Western powers, quote, only object would be to trade with your kingdom, end quote. Up until this point, China had enjoyed a certain influence over Korean politics, which other Asian nations didn't have. China was able to influence who took the throne in Korea and was able to foster better relations with that nation than the other competing Asian countries could. But as early as the late 1860s, Chinese rulers had been telling Korea that they had to open up to Western nations if they were to avoid Japan opening them up themselves. Korea had had a similar aversion to Western trade and Western ideologies as China did, and therefore were hesitant to make any such movements. However, as the Chinese predicted, Japan ends up forcing Korea open. In the mid-1870s, Japan sends a series of boats to the Korean peninsula and open fires. Korea ends up accepting a treaty laid out by the Japanese in 1876. This treaty will allow Japan more access to ports in Korea, and it will also grant Japanese citizens this principle of extraterritoriality that we've seen Westerners seek in China. But the thing that could be most frightening to the Chinese about this treaty is the fact that it basically calls Korea its own sovereign nation, and not one that should be under the influence of China. This is a direct act by the Japanese government to attempt to undermine Chinese influence in Korea and an attempt to take Korean influence away from them for themselves. And given Japan's aggressiveness with these islands, including Okinawa and in Taiwan, this represents yet another place where China could lose some of its power to Japan, one of Li Hong Zhang's biggest fears. So Li's recommendation to Korea is to seek Western influence but be wary of the products and ideologies which might come with it. But it's still better than Japanese influence, at least for China. And in a few decades, the Koreans might agree. But unfortunately, it seems like it's just Li Hung Zhang that really notices Japan's scary expansion. Jonathan Fenby, in his The Modern History of China, notes that Li Hung Zhang is certainly in the minority in recognizing the dangers that Japan represents. He writes, quote, With rare exceptions such as Li Hung Zhang, the Chinese had no conception of what was going on. For them, Japan was an inferior country, its inhabitants known derogatively as dwarves who owed their culture to China. The hollowness of that view should have been apparent in the 1870s, when Japan invaded Taiwan and Beijing had to pay to get it to withdraw. The kingdom of Korea was the logical next step. The peninsula had long been under China's suzerainty, but Tokyo began to try to move across the Korean Strait in the early 1880s, backing a rebel faction at the court in Seoul. China and Japan sent in troops. Li Hung Zhang negotiated an agreement in 1884 for both to withdraw their forces and undertake not to return them without consolations. End quote. However, peace between China and Japan over Korea is short-lived. In 1894, the Korean king faces a peasant rebellion, and he asks Beijing to provide assistance with troops. And when the Qing emperor agrees, Japan responds by sending an even larger force to confront them. Japanese forces invade Seoul, capture the king, and then install a prince who denounces Korea's relationship with China. Li Hong Zhang is called upon to gather China's forces. And these forces that Li Hung Zhang is called to gather are not what they appear to be on paper. On paper, it seems like China might have a million men at their disposal, definitely enough to rout the Japanese. But many of them aren't well-trained or well-equipped, and even if they are well-equipped, many of them don't know how to properly fire a gun. Many of these troops had still been practicing with arrows up until recently. And another aspect to remember is that many of these troops are coming from these militias that had formed during the time of Hung Jiquan and the Taiping Rebellion. Again, we see that these local militias will play a big role in the downfall of the Qing Dynasty. And here's another example. When Chinese troops make their way to Korea, their power on paper does not play out the way that many Chinese think it will. Going back to Fenby's History of Modern China once again, he writes, quote, 
Qing armies were split between regional and princely chiefs. Japan's reunified. The Chinese command system managed to be both suffocatingly centralized and extremely chaotic, the generals milling around in a fog of uncertainty. On the other hand, Japanese commanders were given clear objectives and left to get on with the job in pincer attacks, which flummoxed the Chinese. End quote. This seems to fall in line with William Lang's prediction. This is the British military captain, which we cited earlier. You know, he talked about how Japan was much weaker on paper. They were outnumbered both on the ground and at sea, but that the Chinese military structure and its leadership would be very important. One thing that China will do after this war, that Japan did before this war, is send their men abroad to learn military strategy around the world. And the difference here will make itself quite apparent. In recalling how the first showdown between Japanese and Chinese forces went on the Korean peninsula, one survivor on the Chinese side wrote that, quote, Our comrades fell like mown grass, end quote. Not exactly the start that the Chinese had expected or hoped for. At the Yalu River, soon after, Chinese naval ships get destroyed by Japanese ships. After this, we begin to see Chinese troops retreating more and more, eventually to the point where Japan can cross over into Manchuria, that area that we described as being vital to industrialized nations. Russia just got a piece of it earlier, and now Japan's taking another piece. And as the Japanese move into Manchuria, the Chinese have left behind evidence of their brutal treatment of Japanese captives. They find the heads of their fellow soldiers displayed with noses and ears cut off. They find bodies with their stomachs ripped open, dangling from trees. They find bodies with no eyes, just laying about. The Chinese response is at least equally murderous. Taking from Fenby's book again, Quote, in a pre-echo of future massacres, the victors killed indiscriminately. They drove a group of Chinese into a lake to drown. Civilians were tied together and shot en masse. Soldiers paraded in the streets with human heads held aloft on bayonets. In a bank, they stuck the severed heads on spikes running along the top of a partition. The defenseless and unarmed inhabitants were butchered in their houses and their bodies unspeakably mutilated, an American correspondent James Creelman reported in the New York World. There was an unrestrained reign of murder, which continued for three days. The whole town was plundered with appalling atrocities. End quote. Creelman noted that the civilian death toll was near 2,000. The Chinese subjected to this treatment were not the only ones punished by the Japanese advances. Li Hongzang is also ousted from his role as military commander in Korea. By February of 1895, the Chinese were in a desperate situation. They're fighting ill-equipped, in extremely cold weather against a formidable, well-trained, and much more unified Japanese military. The Japanese have continued to seize ports and captured large amounts of cargo meant for the military. There's starving populations they come into contact with, and the butchery, which we recounted earlier, is still spreading. The Chinese send a number of different negotiators to try and get Japan to accept a ceasefire, but Japan is unlikely to do so, given that they're on a roll and are taking more and more land with each month. Empress Si Chi, the concubine empress that we discussed earlier, Si Chi will recall Li Hong Zhang to carry out negotiations with Japan. The idea here is, well, if he fails, well, we've lost nothing, his reputation is already discredited, but if he succeeds, this will show that the imperial dynasty is acting uh, intelligently or making the right calls in the right situations. In March of 1895, Li Hong Zhang will head for the Japanese port of Shimonoseki, where he will go on to propose an armistice to break off fighting with the Japanese. However, the Japanese are still on a roll, still gaining territory, and they see that the Qing dynasty is as weak as ever. But Li Hong Zhang will put forward the argument that if the Japanese are interested in taking more Chinese territory and restricting Chinese trade, well, then they're likely to face some kind of backlash from Western powers. Western powers have not only infrastructure in China, and they haven't just built up Shanghai and other southern ports, but they have communities of British, Americans, French, Germans, all of these communities living in China, 
whom they're obliged to protect. The Japanese move their position slightly, but are still demanding far too much territory and money from the Chinese for Li Hongzang to take the offer. But something strange happens after this negotiation that will change the course of Asian politics for the next 50 years. As Li Hong Zhang is heading back to his residence after the negotiations end, he's shot in the face by a Japanese assassin, or rather would-be assassin. The bullet strikes him just under his nose, and I'm going to go ahead and read Jonathan Pomfret's telling of the story because it sheds a bit of light on what the personality of Li Hong Zhang might have been like. Pomfret writes, quote, In talks in the port town of Shimonoseki, the Japanese demanded that China agree to all their demands as a condition of a ceasefire. Li Hong Zhang wanted a ceasefire first. As Li returned to his residence following a negotiation session on the afternoon of March 24th, a would-be assassin shot him in the face. With blood spurting from his cheek, the viceroy calmly requested a handkerchief, walked into his residence, and asked for a surgeon to dig the bullet out. End quote. However, according to Jonathan Fenby's account, Li Hong Zhang decided to leave the bullet in there as he was too old to receive anesthetic. Now, this event will have drastic consequences for the Japanese, and they realize this initially as well. They realize how bad of a look it is for a nation to almost have essentially a peace officer assassinated on their own soil. Fenby goes on to describe the reaction of the Japanese. Quote, There was a huge reaction of shock from the Japanese. Their emperor sent his personal physician. The empress rolled bandages and dispatched two nurses. Lee was reported to have received 10,000 letters of condolence. Given the victim's advanced age, the doctors did not dare put him under an anesthetic. And the Chinese statesman decided not to be operated on, but to resume the negotiations as soon as possible. End quote. It's hard to imagine that Li Hongzang was happy about almost getting killed by a bullet to the head, but it did help. It certainly helped his negotiating position, which he is not happy about, or at least can't feel comfortable in. After Li Hongzang is almost assassinated, he heads right back to the negotiating table and hammers out a better deal than he could have ever gotten had this attempted assassination never occurred. This has all made the Japanese look quite bad on the global stage, and it's sort of a way to save face. Anyways, the Japanese likely are looking at the Qing Dynasty's military and looking at their own and saying that they can wait a couple years and go get more territory. But for now, the Japanese have to settle with taking Taiwan off the east coast of China, and also the Liaodong Peninsula, which is in northeast China. But as these terms are being hammered out, an American who Li Hong Zhang and the Chinese have recruited for their purposes is leaking the terms of the agreement to Russia, France, and Germany. And, well, why exactly is he doing this? Well, he's doing this because if these three powers notice that Japan is encroaching upon China's territory, if they notice that, well, they're taking land off the east coast of China and they're also taking major ports in western China, this starts to look like encirclement, something that, well, certainly every nation in Asia is highly on alert for, and something that Western powers who have business interests in China should be aware of. We have to remember that Western powers, well, their goal is to keep China whole for the most part. That is what will allow for business to flow most easily throughout the Chinese empire and will allow easiest access to ports. They don't want Japan to invade China and take over. So Russia will take the lead of this international coalition which will seek to enact what they call the Triple Intervention. And the Triple Intervention is basically Russia, France, and Germany using their power and their influence to force Japan to give back this peninsula in northwest China that they've taken. This peninsula serves the Japanese well. It gives them access to ports which will give them easier access to the west. But Russia's not doing this for free even though it's in their best interest to check Japan. So not only will Russia benefit from being able to use Germany and France for its own interests in getting Japan out of this territory in northwest China, but Russia will also receive permission from the Chinese to build an extension to the Trans-Siberian Railway, which would go all the way into Manchuria, 
In theory, this would be so Russia could protect Chinese sovereignty. But as Henry Kissinger explains in his book on China, this is not exactly what happened. Quote, in the secret agreement, Russia pledged not to use the railway as a, quote, pretext for the infringement of China's territory or for encroachment on the lawful rights and privileges of his imperial majesty, the emperor of China, which was, however, exactly what Russia proceeded to do. Inevitably, once the railway was constructed, the Tsar's representative insisted that the territory adjoining it would require Russian forces to protect the investment. Within a few years, Russia had acquired control over the area Japan had been forced to relinquish, and significantly more. End quote. And once Russia begins to extend its sphere of influence into Manchuria, well, Germany and France take notice as well. They begin taking territories of their own on the peripheries of China's. Germany occupied part of the Shandong Peninsula in northeast China, and France took some territory in southeast China, while also strengthening its hold on Vietnam. So if we were to look at the events that take place just following the end of the First Sino-Japanese War in 1895, we'll notice that the Japanese had taken territory which is now basically divided amongst Western powers. Western powers realize that Japan is encroaching on territory which their interests lie on. But in addition, it's not just that the Western powers took what Japan had, it's that they took additional territory as well. So it'd be easy to sit there and say, okay, well, the Chinese realized that, well, maybe they've bought themselves some time, but it looks like their situation is more dire than it was, even with Japan in Taiwan and in this Northwest Peninsula. However, that's not exactly how the Chinese might be interpreting these events. Within this system that the Chinese have used when it comes to dealing with barbarians, there's this idea of using barbarians to check other barbarians. And this idea can be found in the writings of Ming Dynasty officials, the Ming Dynasty lasting from the 14th century to the 17th. They notice that using barbarians against barbarians is conducive to China's well-being. Because we have to remember again that China actively using its military is actually a sign that the mandate of heaven could be slipping away. It's giving some sort of credit to the military force which is affronting China's. So here's the idea behind using barbarians to check other barbarians. Quote, if the tribes are divided among themselves, they will remain weak, and it will be easy to hold them in subjugation. If the tribes are separated, they shun each other and readily obey. We favor one or other and permit them to fight each other. This is a principle of political action which asserts wars between the barbarians are auspicious for China. End quote. And we might be able to forgive some Chinese administrators for thinking that this idea of checking barbarians against other barbarians is one that could apply to the situation that unfolds after the Sino-Japanese War concludes. Yes, there are many different Western powers who, along with Japan, are chipping away at the outsides of China, who are trying to gain influence in some way or another. And, you know, the problem here is that at the end of the day, you need a strong China that can represent some type of force to confront whoever the victor of this barbarian struggle might be. Now, as Henry Kissinger described it, quote, The strategy of balancing barbarians had worked to a degree. None had become totally predominant in China, and in that margin the Beijing government could operate. But the clever maneuver of saving the essence of China by bringing in outside powers to conclude their balance of power machinations on Chinese territory could function in the long run only if China remained strong enough to be taken seriously, and China's claim to central control was disintegrating. End quote. So what Kissinger's referring to here in terms of bringing in these outside powers to play this, you know, balance of power game around China... Well, yes, it does distract these outside powers from China. However, we're not dealing with nomadic horsemen anymore. We're not dealing with steppe tribesmen. What China fails to understand once again is that the central goal of all of these powers is to exploit China and exploit China in a time of weakness, which, 
China is demonstrating by allowing these outside powers to chip away at their periphery. But, you know, really, what is the other option on the table? There is no option to confront Germany or France or Britain with, you know, a military strike. So what are they to do? Well, one of the things they'll do is they'll commission Li Hung Zhang to meet with the Russians once again and allow for him to negotiate a treaty which will grant Russia the right to extend that railway all the way through Manchuria and allow the Russians more access and will allow them to guard this railway. This will capture the attention of Western powers, surely. After describing how Russia is moving into Manchuria, how France is strengthening its grip on Indochina, and how Britain is doing the same in Hong Kong, Barbara Tuckman, author of General Stilwell and the American Experience in China, 1911 through 1945, describes how these powers shift, the way that they will seek to gain control over China. Tuckman writes the following. Next, they all quarreled over shares in the foreign loans through which China was to pay the Japanese indemnity. Loans were the favored form of penetration after railroads. Competition sharpened greed, and the power settled down to staking out spheres of interest, where each secured a recognized prior right to develop resources and a foothold for future annexation should China ever be partitioned. End quote. So again, up until this point, Britain and the United States are mostly interested in keeping China whole and thus using the Chinese market to their own economic benefit. France had been looking to extend colonial holdings in Indochina, but hadn't encroached directly on Chinese territory quite like the British had. But Russia now is seeming like a force which would like to have all of Manchuria to itself one day thus bringing in the other Western powers to claim their stake if the situation should occur that China ends up being broken apart. At this point, the Qing dynasty should be able to perceive the disastrous situation it's looking at. It's about to watch Japan, who's been a society which has innovated and industrialized at, at such a rapid pace that to say it far outmatched the Chinese pace would not do justice to what Japan's been able to pull off. Japan's pulled off one of the fastest industrial revolutions that can be witnessed, and China's about to fund the next wave of that revolution by having to pay this indemnity, which comes after the end of the First Sino-Japanese War. So there are a number of potential responses to a situation like this. One of the ones that the emperor sitting on the throne will come up with is called the 100 Days of Reform. And we have to take a step back to recognize who is sitting on the imperial throne at this moment. We had earlier in the story discussed this Si Chi character, this concubine turned empress through a series of power maneuvers. Uh, she's somewhat retired at this point, and I use the word somewhat hesitantly, as we'll soon find out. She, in the early 1890s, had given over some of her power, or pretty much all of her power, to a man who comes to be known as the Emperor Guangxu. Guangxu had been installed on the throne when he was four years old back in 1875. He is Si Qi's nephew, and Si Qi saw this as an effective way to maintain her authority. So as he gets to the point of age where he's an adult and he can begin to run things himself, Si Qi leaves behind a number of her advisors for him to, you know, follow. But once these advisors start to fall out of favor with Guangxu, he begins to take the side of advisors who have a different outlook than the perhaps maybe antiquated outlook that Si Qi and her other advisors have. Following the conclusion of the First Sino-Japanese War, the Guangxu Emperor will institute a number of reforms, which to Si Qi look like an obvious turn to the West. The Guangxu Emperor will start ordering the construction of new railways, will start overhauling the imperial examination system by which, you know, the Chinese stocked their bureaucracy. We'll also see the administration begin to encourage young military officers to travel abroad in search for new techniques and new strategies for their military, and also how to systematize such an enormous force like the one the Chinese have. 
And one of the most fascinating aspects of this reform movement has to be how the Guangxu emperor treats the press. He'll call for an open and free press. And this is out of line with what is typical of a Chinese emperor. Fenbi, in his History of Modern China, includes an account concerning this aspect of the reform. Quote, Editors and writers were, quote, not to hold back just criticism, nor are they in future to avoid what has hitherto been considered forbidden subjects for fear of giving offense to the persons criticized, as this will obstruct his majesty's earnest desire of enlightening his ministers and the masses, end quote. But even if, you know, the classes on the ground are probably quite satisfied that they will now get to express their opinions and be able to read a more diverse set of opinions in their local papers, the Manchu ruling class, right, that minority within China who has largely been at the helm of the Qing dynasty courts, well, this part of society will not be so happy with these reforms. This element of society is highly conservative, partly because uh, this conservatism holds in place many of the levers of power which they control. Predictably, they end up, you know, being slow to actually institute these reforms on the ground. And in response to this, the Guangxu Emperor ends up dismissing them. Finally, he ends up dismissing nearly all of what could be called the old self-strengtheners, Li Hong Zhang being the leader. So after the Guangxu Emperor has whittled down his court and freed himself of mostly conservative elements, he undertakes what's called the 100 Days of Reform. And initially, Si Qi isn't actually worried about these reforms, or at least she's not very outspoken about them. She seems mostly concerned with losing the ears and eyes that she has inside the imperial palace. For Si Qi, it's one thing to push for the construction of railroads or push for the construction of new mines. But when the Guangxu Emperor begins to abolish different government offices, which he believes serve no purpose other than to, you know, fund rent-seeking, well, then Si Qi has a problem. Soon following, the emperor issues an order that basically states that he and the empress will begin to travel abroad, first in Japan and then in Europe, as a way of scouting out, basically, some of these Western ideas and Western reform measures that China could take on itself. Predictably, the conservative elements in the imperial dynasty who are still loyal to Si Qi have a very big problem with this. J.O.P. Bland and Edmund Backhouse, in their book China Under the Empress Dowager, discuss uh, how the conservative elements still loyal to Si Qi react to this idea of sending her abroad, which is in tune with all of these other modernizing reforms. They write, quote, Nearly all the conservatives holding high office proceeded in body to the Summer Palace and told the Empress Dowager that the only hope of saving the country lay in her resumption of the supreme power. The old Buddha bade them to wait. The sands were running out, but she was not ready to move. End quote. Soon after this takes place, one of the Guangxu Emperor's advisors will come to him with a plot to capture Si Qi. He calls to mind the fact that Si Qi's been spending lavishly. Uh, the Emperor Guangxu was rather frugal, especially when compared to previous emperors. Um, and she and her advisors were not making this whole reform process very easy. After Bland and Backhouse describe how one of the Emperor's advisors sort of mistakes the advisement of Si Qi to mean that Si Qi is on board with this plot to take back ultimate power over the imperial dynasty. They write, quote, The advisor assured the emperor that Si Qi's professed sympathy for the reform was all a sham, and that, on the contrary, it was she herself who was the chief obstacle to China's awakening, her influence being really the prime factor in the country's corruption and lethargy. Why should she be permitted to waste millions of government funds yearly in the upkeep of her lavish establishment at the Summer Palace? He advised the emperor to surround her residence, seize her person, and confine her for the rest of her days on a small island in the Winter Palace Lake. Thereafter, he should issue a decree recounting her many misdeeds and proclaiming his intention never again to permit her to have any part in the government. End quote. 
bland and backhouse, then go on to explain how it's certainly quite possible that a eunuch spy working for Si Chi was well aware of this conversation. The Guangxu Emperor will make one last decree that will add on to this Reformation movement before the Empress Si Chi steps back into the light of Chinese politics. The Emperor wrote the following, quote, In promoting reforms, we have adopted certain European methods because while China and Europe are both alike in holding that the first object of good government should be the welfare of the people, Europe has traveled further on this road than we have, so that by the introduction of European methods, we simply make good China's deficiencies. But our statesmen and scholars are so ignorant of what lies beyond our borders that they look upon Europe as possessing no civilization. They are all aware of those numerous branches of Western knowledge whose object it is to enlighten the minds and increase the material prosperity of the people. Physical well-being and increased longevity of the race are thereby secured for the masses. Is it possible that I, the emperor, am to be regarded as a mere follower of new and strange ideas because of my thirst for reform? My love for the people, my children, springs from the feeling that God has confided them to me, and that, to my care, they have been given in trust by my illustrious ancestors. I shall never feel that my duty as sovereign is fulfilled until I have risen them all to a condition of peaceful prosperity. Moreover, do not the foreign powers surrounding our empire commit frequent acts of aggression? Unless we learn to adopt the sources of their strength, our plight cannot be remedied. The cause of my anxiety is not fully appreciated by my people, because the reactionary element deliberately misrepresents my objects, spreading the wild baseless rumors as to disturb the minds of men. When I reflect on how deep is the ignorance of the masses, of the dwellers in the innermost parts of the empire on the subject of my proposed reforms, my heart is filled with care and grief. Therefore, I hereby proclaim my intentions, so that the whole empire may know and believe that their sovereign is to be trusted, and that the people may cooperate with me in working for reform and strengthening our country. This is my earnest hope. End quote. So here we see the emperor proposing a dramatic shift away from you know, the type of ideology that the Chinese had working for them at the beginning of this century of humiliation. Right at the beginning, we see Westerners referred almost universally to as barbarians. Now the emperor is informing the Chinese that it's these very barbarians who they must turn to if they're going to keep up with the forces at play around the globe. And in order to gain more support for this movement, he brings in a young general named Yuan Shikai. Shikai has been the protege of Li Hong Zhang. And Yuan Shikai can be viewed as one of the new self-strengtheners. He's brought in and he's, you know, given the down low on what exactly this reform process might look like. And he swears to the emperor his absolute loyalty and promises to undertake whatever efforts he can to make sure these plans go through. Problem is, is that Empress Si Chi is also fairly tight with Yuan Shikai. She calls Yuan Shikai in after she hears of his meeting with the emperor and questions him about what exactly was taking place there. And she basically says that, well, okay, these military reforms seem sensible enough to me, but there's something about the pace at which Emperor Guangxu is moving that has her uneasy. Si Chi is reported to have said the following, quote, By all means, let the army be reformed. The decree is sensible enough. But his majesty is in too great a hurry, and I suspect him of cherishing some deep design. You will await a further audience with him and then receive my instructions. End quote. That being the Empress Dowager to Yuan Shikai. So she basically wants Yuan Shikai to keep informing her of what exactly the emperor is up to. But we should remember well that it's likely that Si Chi has been informed by one of her eunuchs that there's already a plan in place to deprive her of her own power. Soon after, Yuan Shikai is called back into the presence of the emperor, and the emperor proceeds to tell him the full extents of his reform operation, which include a plot to kill one of Si Chi's most trusted allies, a military general whom is to be killed by Yuan Shikai and his men. Yuan Shikai ends up bringing word of this to the very man he's supposed to kill and reveals to him the plot. This man then takes the information up to Si Chi, who then surrounds herself with all of her conservative allies 
and they form a plot of their own. They devise a plan by which the Emperor's guards would be replaced with guards of their own choosing. And the next morning, these guards would take the Emperor prisoner. The day after all of these conservatives meet with the Empress Dowager, this is exactly what happens. A group of guards and eunuchs take the Emperor hostage and inform him that he would wait for the Empress Si Chi to come back and inform him of what the next steps were to be. Si Chi arrives soon after and then dictates a letter for the Emperor to release as his latest decree. She says, quote, The nation is now passing through a crisis, and wise guidance is needed in all branches of the public service. We ourselves have labored diligently, night and day, to perform our innumerable duties. But in spite of all our anxious energy and care, we are in constant fear lest delay should be the undoing of the country. We now respectfully recall the fact that Her Imperial Majesty, the Empress Dowager, has on two occasions since the beginning of the reign of His Majesty performed the functions of regent, and that in her administrations of the government, she displayed complete and admirable qualities of perfection, which enabled her to successfully cope with every difficulty that arose. Recollecting the serious burden of the responsibility we owe to our ancestors and to the nation, we have repeatedly besought Her Majesty to condescend once more to administer the government. Now she has graciously honored us by granting our prayer, a blessing indeed for all our subjects. From this day forth, Her Majesty will transact the business of government in the side hall of the palace. End quote. So if the Emperor Guangxu was seeking to try to expel Si Chi's influence over government, well, all he did was invite her own plotting back into the mix, which proved to outmaneuver his plotting. She takes over government procedures once again. And one might be thinking, well, how exactly is it possible that an emperor who's so forward-thinking, who is trying to stamp out corruption and stamp out rent-seeking and trying to modernize his nation, well, how, how could it be possible that he could be sacked this way with no kind of upheaval involved? Well, this has something to do with the pace of change that the emperor Guangxu was seeking. According to Fenby and to other historians, it was simply too fast. Fenby writes, quote, Though reform had been brewing for three years, the hundred days of 1898 had been too sudden, too little thought out. The historian Zhang Kaiyuan argues convincingly that this impatience was to become a recurrent source of weakness in attempts to change China, with a constant search for instant fixes and a belief in the effect of grand declarations. In 1898, reformers might speak of democracy, but their prime aim was to strengthen China by decree without bothering to seek popular support, following in the age-old pattern of top-down authority." End quote. Fenby then goes on to comment about a factor in this story that will become increasingly more and more important going forward. He writes, quote, The lack of the kind of middle class which was playing such a major role in Europe and the United States meant there was no natural constitution for change. The reform program and the headlong way it was promulgated was bound to arouse the fearful opposition of officials and power holders. End quote. With the Empress Si Chi back at the helm... China will still go forward with a number of the reforms that the now defunct Emperor Guangxu had wanted to institute himself. But the Empress Si Chi will end up making a fatal decision for her rule in China. She'll end up turning against these Western powers that the former emperor, who she just has deposed, was trying to turn towards. And this will accelerate the motivation of some of these powers in the West to break China apart. But in turning against the West, Xi Chi will accelerate the tearing apart of China from within itself. In the years that immediately follow Xi Chi's sacking of the emperor, she and the rest of her imperial administration will be faced with a number of questions to answer. Questions regarding what to do about these Western powers who are, since the end of the First Sino-Japanese War, even more energized in their interest in China's soil. What to do about these Western ideas, which have been something that the Chinese administration has had to deal with all throughout this century. And what to do about the future of China's political body, 
All of these questions will be laid bare before the Imperial Dynasty and require an answer. We'll cover this time period and the time period that follows it, the Chinese descent into warlordism, in part two of our series on the Century of Humiliation. We hope you've enjoyed part one. <laughs>